Rate My Cult, the group formerly known as the Branch Davidians. Branch Davidian sect that resided at Mount Carmel outside of Waco, Texas, we know it as Waco, burned to death on April 19, 1993. They did not call themselves the Branch Davidians. That's what the deed to the property said, so that's what the media called them. But that's not what they called themselves. That's what they had been called prior to David Koresh's leadership. The people who died at Waco didn't ascribe that name to themselves. The media decided and they weren't there to tell their own history. The Branch Davidians, under their new leader, known as Vernon Wayne Howell, he later changed his name to David Koresh, they ran afoul with the ATF for failure to file the proper paperwork associated with firearm sales. Now, in the 90s, the government would lay siege to your home if you didn't file the proper paperwork. That is no joke. It's the second time they did this, very publicly. Now, they've gone soft over the years, but never forget how out of control they were back then. They really, it it became a problem. Now, the ATF raided Mount Carmel on February 28th, 1993, and the agency was repelled by gunfire from the people living inside, the residents, the Branch Davidians. Now, Four ATF agents died, and because four feds died, the FBI came in, and a 51-day siege ensued. At the end of the siege, the FBI, under Janet Reno, attacked the compound and tear-gassed the members. 76 members of the church died in that fire. The government and the press labeled it a mass suicide, and that story became the dominant narrative. Now, for clarity's sake, I'm just going to call them the Branch Davidians because that's what we know them as. But just remember, that's not what they called themselves. Were they a church or were they a cult? David Koresh didn't found this group. They were founded by a man named Victor Hutef, who ran afoul with the Seventh-day Adventists in California and moved his flock and settled on Mount Carmel outside Waco, Texas, just outside Waco, Texas. That was in 1934. These were the Davidians. When Hutef became ill, the sect split into two, and one of the offshoots was called the Branch Davidians, things branch out. And they were led by Ben Roden and his wife, Lois Roden. This in itself is a fascinating story, and we don't really have time for it today, but this was the first schism. I'll sum it up very briefly so you can get an idea of what we're dealing with. The Branch Davidians are an offshoot of an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists. They were formerly known as the Millerites. Remember, we covered that on the video where we talked about millennialism and the apocalypse, et cetera, et cetera. So their founder claimed that the world would end in 1844. And when it didn't, that event became known as the Great Disappointment. The world is not coming to an end. We should be so lucky as for this to all end. No, we just have to deal with it and we have to run around in this muck until we wrinkle and die. And that's if we are lucky. So this apocalypse stuff, I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. But the Seventh-day Adventists believe in end times prophecy. The whole church grew out of that. And they believe that they're going to be new prophets and that those new prophets are gonna give them the scoop. Now, Koresh's gospel, it could not have taken hold in any other religion because a lot of other religions just don't believe in the biblical apocalypse and the book of Revelations like that. So we're in the 1950s and Hotef died and there was some misunderstanding as to his last words, which Hotef's wife ascribed this great meaning that they probably didn't have because it doesn't really mean anything. It's not really real, but that's fine. The widow, Florence Hotef, predicted that the members of Mount Carmel would be slaughtered and then raised to heaven. This didn't happen. It became known, this event became known as the lesser disappointment. And Hotef's followers migrated to Ben Roden. That year was 1959. We are still 30 years shy of Waco. Many of the members of the Branch Davidians that actually followed Howell, later known as David Koresh, They had been part of the church at Mount Carmel in that community going back for decades, even generations before David Koresh came along. 
Now, I will call our lead David Koresh because that's what the media knows him as, but his given name was Vernon Wayne Howell, and he didn't change his name until 1988. He changed it to David Koresh, David like King David, and Koresh, which is the Hebrew version of Cyrus who liberated the Jews from Babylon in the Bible. And you're like, oh, wasn't it Moses who liberated the Jews? But this was a different time. This was different liberation, just Cyrus, Koresh. They needed a lot of liberating. It's in the Bible. Anyway, Vernon Wayne Howell, also known as David Koresh, are the same person. Just keep that in mind. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a little fuzzy on the pronunciation of the name Koresh. When the FBI negotiator asked David Koresh for the pronunciation, David Koresh said, have you ever heard a man die? And the negotiator said, yes, I have, unfortunately. And David Koresh said, it's like that. It's like the last breath of a dying man. Koresh. I'm just glad that never came up on wording is hard because that would have been awkward. I'm gonna say Koresh. I'll be honest, I've never heard a man die. Let's hope it stays that way. So if I mispronounce it, cut me some slack. Don't be in the comments with some morbid, morbid commentary. I just, uh, I'm good. Koresh, okay? Like the last breath of a dying man. Anyway, under Ben Roden, now he was the leader from 1959 to 1978. The Branch Davidians grew and they set up churches all over the world, particularly in England, in Australia, and in Israel. His wife, Lois, actually settled 30 families in Israel. And then she came back to Waco. How glad do you think those families are to have been living in Israel when this all happened? I'm sure they were horrified by the news. Of course they were horrified by the news, we all were, but a small part of them must have been like, glad that wasn't me. Glad we settled in Israel. After the death of her husband, Ben, Lois came to lead the Branch Davidians. Her stewardship lasted about 1978 to around 1984 when they split again and most of the flock followed Koresh. So yes, Lois was a prophet and Seventh-day Adventists allow for prophets and they allow for female prophets. However, <laughs> however, Lois's teachings were downright heretical because she taught that the Holy Trinity the Father, who is God, the Son, who is Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, who is a question mark, that this was a family and the Holy Ghost was actually the female member. And she, she justified it like this. So God created the world. How can God and the Son create the world? They can't create anything. G Father and mother, so God and the Holy Ghost, they can create because they have the creative powers of this material world. So she justified it like this. And the Branch Davidians agreed with her, but the Seventh-day Adventists completely disavowed her. This was heretical teaching. We talked about heresy many times on this channel. So this just was over the line. Now in the series, in the recent series on Showtime, Waco, The Aftermath, they actually go into her teachings. Anyway, David Koresh, still Vernon Howell, came to the compound in 1981 after a nasty breakup with what he calls his first love, which was 100% Koresh's fault. This wasn't the man you saw on TV in 1993. This was still in his early development stage. See, Howell Koresh was a learning disabled child and he only learned how to read the Bible. His childhood friends, they called him Mr. Retardo, which isn't very nice, but he had failed every single grade and he had to go into special ed so he could learn how to read. So yes, 76 people died at Waco and another 168 died in Oklahoma City because of the actions of a Mr. Retardo. Don't ever let anyone tell you God doesn't have a sense of humor because he absolutely does. Although Mr. Retardo started preaching the Bible very early, he didn't live by it. He gave into his carnal desires and he made love with this young woman the woman he calls his first love. He had an affair with her. She appears to actually be a lovely young woman, but he got her pregnant. And when she called and told him that she was pregnant, he lied and said that he was sterile. A prophet, of course a prophet. Yeah, so wouldn't a prophet do this thing? Anyway, she got an abortion, but for some reason, probably because she was young and dumb, she actually took him back. They were dating for a few years until he got her pregnant again. At this point, her father found out that Koresh Howell was the father of the first aborted pregnancy. 
He got so mad, he ran him off his property. He ran him out of the house and away from his daughter. So this father is the real hero in this story. And that's how David Koresh, also known as Vernon Wade Howell, also known as Mr. Retardo, ended up at Mount Carmel in Waco, Texas. Now, Koresh called himself the sinful messiah, but his faults weren't that he was sinful. His faults were that he was a self-absorbed coward who did not live up to his own grandiose view of himself. I will prove this many times over this video. How did David Koresh wind up in charge of the Branch Davidians, you asked? Well, he seduced Lois Roden. She was about 70 at this time and he seduced her. He said he was fulfilling biblical scripture, that God would allow him to impregnate Lois just as Abraham impregnated Sarah. But you'll be surprised to know that this did not happen. Lois did not get pregnant and he really just slept with her a lot and gotten her good graces. Here's a side note, and it's a good one, not necessarily related, but kind of. Isn't it funny how we have seen the intellectual classes use their intelligence to get what they want? Just like David Koresh used the Bible to get what he wanted. It's the base desires that are winning and whatever adopted worldview these people have get weaponized in service of these base desires. We've learned it a lot in the past three years with the intellectuals and we've learned it a lot with science being weaponized, etc how their, their navel-gazing BS has justified the most animalistic mob behavior. And we learned that last century with the Nazis in World War II. And we learned it with Koresh in Waco with his Bible, SSDD. It's just they want to do their animalistic base behavior. And they're gonna justify it however they're gonna justify it. But Koresh had a vision that he should bed Lois and God hath told him so. So they had a fling and Koresh ended up as the head of the Branch Davidians. Now it was supposed to go to Lois's son, George Roden, but George was troubled. He was bad at preaching and he was prone to anger. And he seemed to have some form of Tourette's. Like he had an impulse control problem that really scared people away. And nobody wanted to follow him. None of the Branch Davidians wanted to follow George. Koresh, still Howell, previously known as Mr. Retardo, just keep it in order, he's got a lot of names. He left Mount Carmel with most of the Branch Davidian followers, and they took up residence in Palestine, Texas, on a camping ground. Now, in Palestine, they had no electricity, they had no running water, they had left their homes, their homes that they had grown up on, that was at Mount Carmel. And they had developed these homes, they just had to leave them behind and go camping, basically. And they would rather do this than follow George Roden. Of course, George Roden was upset by all of this. And to prove that Koresh was not Messiah, George Roden, in a perfectly sane and normal fashion, dug up the body of a Branch Davidian who had been dead for 20 years and challenged Koresh to raise her from the dead. Easy peasy for the Messiah, just like that, raise a body from the dead after 20 years. Well, <laughs> Koresh knew he couldn't do this, it was a ridiculous request. So he went to the police and said, George is digging up bodies, but the police needed photographic evidence. Look, I'm just gonna be real with you. Do you think the police needed photographic evidence or was the officer on duty just over all of this? Imagine a group of people you may think of as freaks come to you with this morbid nonsense. The police officers are like, yeah, sure. You live in the woods and he's digging up bodies. We'll help you, but we need a photo. Otherwise we're not getting involved. Anyway, so Koresh, Koresh goes and he gets a photo, but he got a photo just of the coffin. He didn't get a photo of the body and the police still probably over it. I'm assuming they're over it. We're over all of this. They're just like, ah, it's not good enough. We're gonna need a photo of the body. So Koresh and some followers go back to Mount Carmel to get the photographs of the body. They're found out by George's hunting dogs and a shootout ensues. Yada, yada, yada. Koresh and his followers wind up on trial for attempted murder. Now, luckily for Koresh and his followers, George Roden was so nuts that after the defense put him on the stand, the jury completely acquitted David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. Now, later, George Roden went insane and wound up in an insane asylum because he hacked to death one of his followers. It turns out the Branch Davidians were absolutely right to not follow this guy. Like imagine how bad things could have turned out if they had followed George Roden. Oh, nightmare. 
the followers of David Koresh moved back into Mount Carmel, which was in complete disarray after George Roden's brief stewardship. They got to work cleaning up. They didn't have heat or air conditioning. The only room that did have these things was David Koresh's room. Lucky for David. Vernon Wayne Howell changed his name to David Koresh in 1988. The Branch Davidians started a gun dealing business. They also sold food rations and survival gear. These included vests. These included vests for hunters and those vests had dummy grenades on them. Why does that matter? Well, in 1992, a UPS driver saw dummy grenades in a package he was delivering to the Branch Davidians out about Carmel. And the driver alerted the ATF, the Bureau of uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Now, that was one of the things that led to the ATF investigation of the Branch Davidians. Now, the ATF was part of the Department of the Treasury in 1993. It wasn't until after federal restructuring after 9-11 that the agency became part of the Justice Department. So you're like, why is this happening under the Treasury? Why is there a Treasury report? Well, it's because the ATF was a bunch of pencil-pushing accountant nerds who went after tax discrepancies. Why am I so critical of the ATF in all this? I'm not a fan of David Koresh, but I'm also very critical of the ATF. So, so David Koresh was crazy and his followers went along for the ride long after they should have gotten off. Their first gun battle, I would think. Yeah, this is a, this is a warning sign. Well, yes, the Branch Davidians were nuts, but what they were doing would not have been illegal if they had filed the proper paperwork. Now, did they have the right paperwork? The Treasury report says that they did not, but the warrant that the ATF came to serve that day, that day, February 28th, was flimsier than wet toilet paper. It was criticized in every congressional report. Meanwhile, David Koresh seems to have been a sexual predator. He married many women, particularly young women, under 18. His first official wife, her name was Rachel, she was 14 when they got married. And he had many more wives after that and concubines. Now, first he went through all the single women of the compound, and then he took the married ones. Basically, basically, the men became cucks while he impregnated their wives. Like the Bible told him to do. Conveniently, God tells him to do everything he wants to do. Just remember that. God comes down and says, David, you should knock up all these men's wives. Says I, God. Anyway, here, here to me is sort of another inflection point, like, if you stay with the group after the leader tells you he's going to marry your wife and impregnate her, you're in a cult. This is the cult point, the tipping point, and you're a cuck. There's no two ways about it. You, you cannot even debate this. People talk about sunk cost fallacy. They say, if we leave now, we would have wasted all of these years. Yes, that's true. But at least Mr. Retardo won't be plowing your wife. You gotta know when to take the L and move on, in life and in cults. Nevertheless, Koresh's philandering wasn't technically illegal. Cult members who bore Koresh's children left the birth certificate blank where the father's name should have been, and that's not legal or wasn't legal under Texas law. But Koresh could marry girls this young if he had their parents' permission, which he did. This was Texas law in 1993, so... Now, the pedophilia is in the Treasury Department's report, but it's outside the jurisdiction of the ATF. However, the American public did not overlook it. They were very concerned with Koresh's perversions. And you know what? If you can't get Al Capone for murder, you get him on tax evasion. So I don't know. I don't know if that's what happened here. I'm just saying. I am just saying. The Waco siege was the second black eye for the ATF in the early 90s. They also had attacked the Weaver family at Ruby Ridge, that was in 1992, and they killed Weaver's wife and his son. So this really begs the question, why were there so many federal sieges in the early 90s? It went Ruby Ridge, Waco, and then Oklahoma City. It was kind of a three-part series. And Oklahoma City was kind of the federal comeuppance uh, in which these white supremacists uh, under Timothy McVeigh, they said he worked alone or almost alone, they took revenge on the Oklahoma Federal Building for federal overreach. 
But it's very important to note, it's very, very, very important to note that the Branch Davidians were not white supremacists. People of all races lived at Mount Carmel. They were anti-government and that aligns closely with white supremacist ideology. But the Branch Davidians never claimed any doctrine relating to race whatsoever. And nor did the feds. The feds, they'll hire white, black, Latino, Asian, any young narc that meets the qualifications, feds will hire you. Okay. Race is not an issue here. And that is so beautiful in a way. Can you even tell the race of a charred corpse? No. Dental records have no race. It like brings a tear to my eye. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. The public knows most about the siege and the fire that ended it. And there's a lot of information available on that. I will briefly review what happened for the people who are not aware, uh, and I'll review the subsequent fallout, but that's not really what Rate My Cult is about. We're here for the quality of the cult and its teachings. If this is your first Rate My Cult, that's what we do here. Anyway, on February 28th, 1993, the ATF was scheduled to serve a search warrant at Mount Carmel. Of course, as you do when you're going to serve a search warrant, they called all the press so the press could be there for their photo op, for their big picture. Get my picture. I guess this is because uh, the ATF are serious people. Now, one of the members of the press got lost, so he asked a mailman for directions. That mailman happened to be a member of the Branch Davidians. This blew the element of surprise. The ATF had a man on the inside, uh, Agent Robert Rodriguez. He's played by um, John Leguizamo in this latest Waco Aftermath. And that man ran back and he told the ATF the element of surprise had been blown. Said, call off the raid. There's no more surprise. But the ATF commanders decided to go along with it anyway. And obviously it ended in disaster. They just didn't listen to him. They thought they knew better. Now, the ATF later sued the press for telling the Branch Davidians about the raid, and the press settled, but they admitted no wrongdoing. Why does the ATF need some 90s-style TMZ reporting on their raid? Off the bat. Anyway, that is a long story. We do not have time for it now. But they sued, and they won with no wrongdoing. Anyway, we do not know who shot first at the raid when they were serving the warrant. Each side blamed the other, but after a long shootout, four ATF agents and six Branch Davidians were dead. They called a ceasefire because the ATF was out of ammo. Now the ATF retreated and the FBI were called in because feds had died. Just remember this, please remember this. You cannot fight the law with guns because they will always win. There's always more lawmen with more ammunition than there are of you, but you can fight them in court and then good luck. <laughs> Best of luck. Best of luck, seriously. But the FBI came in and they tried to negotiate. And this siege, it lasted for 51 days in total. There were some victories for the FBI negotiators, like the release of more than 30 of, uh, not hostages, the 30 of the members, including many children. However, unfortunately, there was a rift between the FBI negotiators and the tactical team, the people actually on the front lines with the guns, you know, tough guys, and the tactical team eventually won out. Now the Branch Davidians had plenty of chances to surrender and there were many close calls. On the third day, Koresh said that they would surrender if, if the FBI released uh, a sermon of his to the media, to play to the media. And the FBI did this. They played the sermon and you can look it up. It was long-winded. <laughs> It put me to sleep. It was very inside baseball, Christian style. Um, it didn't get the reaction Koresh anticipated. And the public saw it for what it was, which was Christian psychobabble. So conveniently, oh, so conveniently, God told Koresh not to surrender. Wow, isn't God always on Koresh's side? That's great. Then later on, later on, in the later parts of the siege, the FBI negotiators got Koresh to agree to surrender after he'd written down his theology on the seven seals in the book of Revelations. And he did release the first seal, but FBI headquarters thought that this was just, this was just a technique to stall and to buy time. And they didn't really believe in all of this seven seal stuff. They didn't want to give it any, any space. They didn't want to wait for the release of the rest of the seven seals. So they just went in. It was Janet Reno's decision. They just said, go in. 
So the FBI went in on April 19th. And it's funny, but not funny, haha, funny like, oh my God, that's sad and depressing. That as the FBI was going in with tanks and tear gas, they told the Branch Davidians, this is not an attack. Like, ignore the tanks in your living room. You are not under attack. By any definition of the word attack, it was an attack. Now, 2023, the FBI would just seize Wikipedia and redefine the word attack. And then they could be like, see, the definition of the word attack changed. So you're not under attack. Convenient. There are so many instances in this story of the FBI and the ATF straight up lying to the public and lying to the Branch Davidians. But that's beyond the scope of this video. Just remember, the FBI will lie. And they'll lie to your face too. They don't seem to care. Now, the FBI said they were putting in epic amounts of tear gas to force the mothers to surrender with their children. The FBI did not listen to their informant or former cult members who told them explicitly that this would not work. They said it in no uncertain terms. This is not going to work on the Branch Davidians, that this strategy would absolutely backfire. The Branch Davidians did not surrender their children. A few gave themselves up. There were some who came out because of the heat of the fire, but they did not surrender their children. Over the course of the siege, the ones that gave themselves up also got arrested and tried. So there is a reason why the Branch Davidian adults did not surrender. It wasn't just like surrender and we're cool. It's like, no, surrender and you're going to prison. So whatever. The holes that the tanks made in the building created these insane wind tunnels and the tear gas the FBI used were mixed basically with paint thinner. And also there was a lot of kerosene that the Branch Davidians had everywhere because they didn't have electricity they needed for their lamps. Now here's where it kind of gets tricky. Who started the actual fire? Mount Carmel was a complete powder keg by noon on April 19th. Just a powder keg, any spark would have set it off. The official narrative is that the Branch Davidians started that fire. And there's testimony to support that narrative. There's testimony to support it. Um, there's evidence to support it. There's also evidence on the other side, but we're not gonna go into that right now. But let's just say it's not 100% certain who started that fire or how that fire started. That is a question for centuries to come. There will always be doubts as to who started that fire, but there is evidence to support the government narrative of mass suicide. Koresh and many of his followers died not from the flames or the asphyxiation, they died from self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Only a handful of people made it out that day. The rest, including all of the children, died and were incinerated in the flames. It was broadcast over live TV. And after the Davidian flag fell, uh, the ATF raised their flag. That's the siege was over and the American people moved on. Yeah, they really raised their flag up like, oh, is this medieval times? I don't know. <sighs> it's a funny note. It's not funny. Ha ha, more funny. Wow, that's just impressive. There was a made for TV movie that came out in May of 1993. So basically immediately after it happened, it's called In the Line of Duty Ambush in Waco. And it completely supports the government narrative. It, it's well acted, okay? <laughs> it's, it's well done. I mean, the In the Line of Fire series is actually a series about police bravery. So it wouldn't have been made if it did not support the government narrative. I'm just here to say I respect that it was done so quickly. Like, I really respect the hustle. You gotta write, you gotta cast, you know, you gotta shoot, you gotta edit. Technically, it's impressive. And the guy who played David Koresh, was it Tim Daly? What's his name? Anyway, he did a great job. He's one of the best Koreshes I've ever seen. So there's that. Now, years later, two years later to the day, Waco inspired the Oklahoma City bombing. So that was April 19th, 1995. There were congressional investigations into Waco in 1996 and 2000. The one in 2000 happened after the release of the documentary Rules of Engagement that was released in 1997. Now, both of these hearings concluded that the ATF acted foolishly, but it was the Branch Davidians who started the fire that killed them. It was not the ATF or the FBI that murdered the Branch Davidians. Now, since 1993, Waco has been the subject of many books, many movies, many documentaries. I mentioned Waco Rules of Engagement that prompted the second investigation that was more critical 
of the FBI and the ATF, very critical. And hey, hey, they back it up. They back it up. Alex Jones got his start advocating for Mount Carmel to be rebuilt. Now, I wonder if Alex Jones could really name much about their beliefs, but anyway, that's how Alex Jones got his start. Paramount came out with a series last year. It's actually a really good series. It might've been two years ago. And there's currently a series on Showtime called Waco the Aftermath. Boy, was there an aftermath. Just putting it lightly, Waco may prove to be one of the most important events of our lifetime. Now at the site, there is a memorial. There's a memorial at Mount Carmel. The Branch Davidians are in two fractions. Well, since the followers of David Crash did not call themselves the Branch Davidians, so we're back to one faction, which is the Branch Davidians, led by a man who never followed David Crash. These were followers of Lois Rodin, and he's leading a sect of the modern Branch Davidians. And then there are some survivors of the Mount Carmel disaster. They lead another sect. And the survivors, so sad, but they're hoping for the resurrection of Koresh and their dead family members. It's really, really tragic. But here's a note, here's a note for future cult leaders. It's not hard to get the government to kill you. They will martyr you. The government and the police, they kill people all the time. It's called suicide by cops. The difficult thing is the resurrection, okay? When's the last time you heard of these people getting risen after they were martyred? The dying, that's the easy part. I'm with crazy ass George Roden on this, raise a body and then I'll be impressed. Then I'll follow your cult, but it's easy to die, hard to get resurrected. Okay, so now that you know the bare minimum of what there is to know about the Branch Davidians under David Koresh, how do they stack up against other cults? This is Rate My Cult after all, and you know we've got a system. Rate My Cult, the cult formerly known as the Branch Davidians. Number one, doctrine and beliefs. The Branch Davidians under David Koresh were obsessed with the book of Revelation and the seven seals, which they believed only David Koresh could open because he had told them so. The seven seals are the signs of the apocalypse. So, and I heard as it were a great thunder and a voice said, come and see. And I saw and behold a pale horse and the name it said on it was death. Is this Revelations? Or is this The Man Comes Around by Johnny Cash? You just need to know the song by Johnny Cash. You don't need to go read the whole book. That's, uh, that's not essential for this. So that's the seven seals, uh, the four horses of the apocalypse and how we will know that the end is coming. Nobody rides horses anymore and they're completely useless in warfare. If the Bible had said, and behold, a white robot and the name it said on it was Alexa, I'd perk up a little. I'd be like, what? Really? That's just to get me. I understand other people, like the Branch Davidians, cared as it was written. However, Koresh claimed that true Christians care and that only the true Messiah could decipher the seven seals. This is very important to their belief system. The Branch Davidians were an apocalyptic cult that came out of the Seventh-day Adventists who have since completely disavowed them. Completely, of course, of course. Ugh. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists come out of a long tradition of false apocalypse claims. <laughs> they do this, they, they do it, they do it. Come on, they do it sometimes. And so it was easier for the Branch Davidians to recruit from Seventh-day Adventists. Now these are Old Testament biblical Christians, the Adventists, they keep Saturday as the Sabbath and they practice dietary restrictions, unlike most Christians, okay? And they also come from a long line of apocalyptic teachers. David Koresh's sermon that he released on the third day of the siege sounds like the ramblings of someone obsessed with the Bible. He's not preaching to the masses, only to people who know the Bible inside and out, or people who claim to know the Bible inside and out. Koresh read the Bible and only the Bible. He may have benefited from a larger library. Now, the Branch Davidians thought that they would be saved and through martyrdom, they would become martyrs. But as we've discussed many times in the past, the difference between getting yourself killed and being a martyr is a few hundred years and a good storyteller. And we'll see, we'll see. You know what, the future will tell. The future will tell us if they were martyrs. They did not get resurrected. Surprise, surprise. The beliefs of Koresh's followers were so-so, but the follow-through 
is absolutely fantastic. Second to none, fire and brimstone. And they were not all talk. It was really fire and brimstone. It's actually kind of sad. So uh, half points for his terrible rambling sermon. Koresh was a musician and the first seal he released might have made a decent album, actually. It was basically album lyrics with the right music behind it and it's just not on its own. But as a religious text, it was mid. So half points. Now, customs and rituals. The Branch Davidians under David Koresh, their standout custom seems to have been making Christian rock songs. Points taken away for the music being bad. You can look it up on YouTube. I am not a fan. This guy had a good voice, but none of this makes the playlist. None of them had a hook. Like God spoke to you and he didn't give you a hook, no melody, nothing. Okay, you know we respect art on this channel. We respect art on this channel. So yes, I would have added points if he had transcended the mortal coil through music. Everybody knows Jesus' rock band would have been fire. Half the disciples would have been songwriters or music producers. This is common biblical knowledge. The thong song is more inspired than anything David Koresh ever put out. <laughs> he could have done something with the instrumental jam. Maybe someone in the audience can remix it. And he could have done something with this one that he had called uh, Locadian. Locadian. It was called Locadian. But the recording quality isn't very good. Yeah, the voice on the recordings, it's haunting. But if he didn't die in a fire, no one is going to take notice. The judges aren't turning around for this without the fire. Okay, hindsight is 2020. Koresh clearly did not have the chops to make it in the music world because art takes rejection and reworking. You really have to hit bottom and then build yourself back up. You gotta be very self-critical and he was not. In another universe where he was more self-critical, maybe he could have tried and maybe he could have made it. Maybe life would have been different for David Koresh. And 30 years later, he would have been a Christian rock influencer and no one would have had to die. Here's what I think. If the FBI really wanted to end this siege, they wouldn't have used negotiators. They would have used a sleazy music agent. They would have promised David Koresh a two album deal. So like, Bubby, Bubby, the people aren't into your lectures. You're not Norman Mailer, okay? They're not going for it. What they want from you is an album and I can get you a deal. That would have gotten Dave Koresh and his followers out of that building. He'd have done a few years, of course, but he'd be out by now and he'd be on Twitter shooting Bud Light cans and everyone would be happy. The FBI robbed us of some serious entertainment. I'm mad about it. Other customs and rituals, the Branch Davidians spent hours working on their compound. Of course, they had to improve it after George Roden had ruined it, had let it go. Now, was this a custom or was it a necessity? Shared work definitely brings people together. Also, Koresh would hold these Bible studies for hours upon hours at a time. There he would ramble about his teachings and none of it was written down. I imagine this had the same effect, the same mesmerization effect as those four hour YouTube documentaries that tend to get people. His followers had a random and insufficient diet. They were forbidden certain foods for a period of time, particularly rich foods, decadent foods, they couldn't have it. Not Koresh, however. David Koresh ate whatever he wanted, even junk food, because God said he should. God said, David, I want you to have these Doritos. This came straight from God. It came straight from God. Prove me wrong. So David Koresh could have all the foods he wanted, but his followers could not. And if you questioned him, he could cite a Bible verse telling you why. So convenient. One time he made his hungry followers sit through one of his long Bible lectures and he ate ice cream in front of them. Finally, after, after it was all done, he let them go eat. So half points for bad music, half points to the FBI for depriving the public of a David Koresh on Twitter in 2023. They don't have the right to do that. Moving on to brainwashing techniques. Top notch. Koresh moved his followers to the second location. See, Lewis Rodin had been sending out tapes, but Koresh stopped this practice. He said, if people want to learn the truth, they have to come to Mount Carmel. This also means that David Koresh isn't held accountable for the things he says because there's no record of it. Smart, smart. Mr. Retardo, me thinks not. Anyway, accounts vary on whether he took all their money. Now, according to the Sinful Messiah by the Waco Tribune, uh, that was published actually the day before the first raid. 
He did take all their money. But according to Ashes of Waco, you see this? Uh-oh, uh-oh, this good book, by Dick J. Vin, Dick J. Revis, he did not take all of their money. If he had, they would have been more dependent on the group because they wouldn't have had many resources or any resources to escape. Now, even if Koresh had them working on the compound and not out in the community having real jobs, then they weren't earning money. So they didn't have the resources or means to escape either. So either way, these a lot of these people probably didn't have the resources to get out of there and restart their lives. Koresh also practiced sleep deprivation with his followers. He made them work full days, outside in the Texas heat, and then come in and listen to his Bible lectures at night. Now, sleep deprived people go on autopilot. They just don't have the resources to make these decisions. We discuss this a lot. Now, we've mentioned how Koresh restricted their diets. This is not uncommon for Adventists, but Koresh took it too far. Adventists, they're often vegetarian. They don't drink alcohol. So it's just more of that. Koresh also broke up families, and he broke up couples and took men's wives. A former member actually theorized that this helped Koresh because nobody had a confidant anymore. Now think about it. Your wife or your husband is your best friend. So they were never alone together to question David Koresh or his methods. They couldn't plan an escape. Everyone was just, just on their own with Koresh in charge. And the big bonus for David is he gets to have sex with all the women. And the other men have sex with none of the women, even if it's their spouse. He annulled all the marriages to do this. And really, he didn't have the authority to annul those marriages. But the people gave him the authority, unfortunately. Former followers recount how Koresh played violent movies to his followers, movies like Apocalypse Now or Full Metal Jacket. He had them train with guns. He taught them about suicide in case they should ever get cornered by the feds. And I guess you could say that this was their business, survival business, but it also made the environment more apocalyptic. Former followers report that Koresh demanded control over all of his followers' movements. They had to declare a reason to go into town. There were guards outside, which isn't illegal in and of itself. Of course, it's not illegal, but it also provided a source of information to David Koresh. Think about it like this. There are guards at stores and there are guards at prison. One is to keep people out and the other is to keep people in. What kind of guards were these? and all of everyone's movements could be tracked and reported to Koresh. A family member of one of the followers actually tells this story. She took her family members who were Branch Davidians into town to do shopping and Koresh didn't want them to go in. And while they were out, their car broke down and the family members, they were like, David did this. He's upset that we went into town. He cursed the car. Now, David Koresh never claimed the ability to perform miracles, but he would always take credit for something. He would always take credit for something. Real opportunist here. So great brainwashing, full credit. Villains always remember. Get them to the second location and everybody else always remember. Never go to the second location. Full points. Moving on to quality of the followers. Fantastic. These were great followers. You could not ask for better followers than this. First, they were all former Adventists. So they were primed to believe this kind of stuff. That's not something David Koresh did. That's something that decades of grooming by their parents did. The parents fattened the chicken and David the fox came and snatched it up. His followers backed him up with his gun battle with George Roden. They took back Mount Carmel, which was their home long before it was David's. They learned about guns and they learned how to fight. They made vests for his survival company. They gave him their wives and their daughters. You really can't get better loyalty than this. And when it was time, they died for him. Full credit to his followers. Were they good parents? No, no, they were not good parents. The FBI was wrong here. This is where the FBI went wrong because they could not acknowledge that a belief system would be so powerful that mothers would let their children suffer to uphold it. But that is exactly what happened. That's exactly what this was. And also many people warned the FBI that the Branch Davidians were like this. So half points to the FBI again. Why am I giving the FBI points? This isn't rate my call to FBI. I just think if Janet Reno had done half of her job, 
there wouldn't have been a Waco. She just had to do half of the job. People will charge a machine gun for a belief system. Remember, patriotism is a belief system too. So I hope everybody at the FBI watches my videos twice and takes notes. Yes, people will kill themselves and they will kill their children over a belief system. So extra points to the Branch Davidians who died that day were on AP credit rules. Even Jonestown and Heaven's Gate don't come close to this. Jonestown and Heaven's Gate, they drank sugar water. They drank Kool-Aid, yum, 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 and then just fell asleep and died. The people at Waco were engulfed in flames. That is so metal. That's like some Cathars walking into the burning fire kind of devotion. Now, I wish the surviving family members who believe that their dead loved ones will be resurrected, I hope that they find peace. Just gonna say that. I know I made a lot of jokes, but I really hope they find peace. All right, last but not least, we have charismatic leader. By all accounts, David Koresh, formerly known as Vernon Wayne Howell, was not charismatic. People who met him said that he seemed small, they were not impressed by him in person. He had a conversational tone in his sermons, they said. Now, listening to the sermon that he released on day three, it sounds like a raving lunatic. No wonder why he didn't want to sell tapes. Followers say that he had this ability to quote the Bible and speak for so long that it was kind of mesmerizing. They got caught in a spell. They got caught in his psychobabble trap. Now, for Koresh, this is Christian psychobabble. But we have seen other kinds of psychobabble from different cult leaders. Doe from Heaven's Gate is still the best psychobabble to date. David Koresh's sermon from Waco has absolutely nothing on Doe. Now, most people, especially the American public, they were not taken in by Koresh's tape. But a handful of people who is completely taken in is worth more than 10,000 people who simply approve of your message. See, this is where cult leaders have the edge over influencers. Caught you slipping, influencers. Anyway, Koresh had a lot more success traveling across the country, across the world, and gaining followers in person. He also convinced Lois Roden's followers to commit even more time and resources than they had already been committing. This includes their young daughters. Now here is a segment from Sinful Messiah in which a survivor recounts how she was lured to Waco. One morning when she was 14 years old, Buns walked out of her home expecting her brother, David, to drive her to school. David, though, was rapidly listening to Howell, then 24. When she returned home that afternoon, Howell was outside with his brother, Roger. When Howell tried to introduce Buns, she snubbed both of them. She did have something to say to Roger, though. Your brother is a blank, she said. That remark earned Robin a harsh spanking from her father. Vernon Howell had changed what it meant to be a Branch Davidian. Before, Don and Janine Buns sent money religiously to Ben and Lois Roden, the cult's prophets, but they only occasionally visited Mount Carmel. It was being farmed at the time, and there were horses for children to ride. Before, it was harmless, Robin Bunn said. You sent tithes, had services. When Vernon came along, he totally changed it. He said you had to give him all your money. You had to live on the property. You had to give up everything else. You had to give him your mind and your body. The cost of being a Branch Davidian rose when Howell became prophet. Note how Koresh convinced the parents, and the parents of this girl actually beat her when she spoke against Koresh. Later, she moved to Mount Carmel and had a child by David Koresh, but she was able to escape with the boy. Koresh had as many as 60 wives and concubines. Apparently, it's in the Bible, and God said so. The Messiah at the end will bear 24 children who will become the 24 elders and rule the earth one day. Koresh may have had the biggest harem we have covered on this series to date. 60, it's impressive. Extra points for his cruelty and disrespect towards the husbands and fathers of these women. In the Smithsonian documentary, Clive Doyle, he lost his daughter in the fire, unfortunately. He said that you had to be okay with Koresh's wishes or you had to accept that you've wasted your life. So he chose to be okay with it and he lost his daughter, she burned, she burned. Now, fellas in the audience who aren't sociopaths, can you really imagine looking at a man who's built a life with you, who's fought alongside with you, and you tell him that you should sleep with his wife? Koresh was a sick man. Now, people say he was authentic, but come on. The only way I buy that he was completely authentic is if he really was Mr. Retardo and he was too stupid to know what was going on. 
I don't buy for a second that he thinks God is more concerned with his chips than with other people's wives. The documentaries, all the documentaries say that he was authentic, but we are too many cult leaders in for me to buy that 100%. People use all sorts of justifications for their animalistic behavior, but it's the instinct you've got to judge. It's the instinct I judge. And Koresh's instincts were selfish. He just justified it with the Bible and with God. It's justifications. Koresh beat children. He beat babies when they cried or they fidgeted during his long-winded sermons. Here is another segment from The Sinful Messiah. Howell's petulance often led him to whip children, Robin Bunn said. She said Howell hit 10-month-old Sean Bunn's with a paddle at Mount Carmel after the baby wouldn't come to him. I was shocked, Bunn said, but I realized he wanted him to love his father. In a normal family, the child knows who his father is, but Vernon was never around to know as a daddy. He shows up and thinks it's time to discipline Sean because he's spoiled. He's not spoiled. He was scared of Vernon. Bunn said Sean Bunn's bottom bled after the whipping. You know how soft and sensitive a baby's skin is? Buns asked. His bottom was hit so much that the skin was raw. It's not like a scrape. It's just where the skin is hit so much that it bruises and can't take any more and bleeds. He was especially cruel to his son, Cyrus, who he made sleep in rat infested barns multiple times. Cyrus died in the fire along with 12 of his other children and their mothers. God. And babies don't have gas masks. They don't make gas masks for babies. How much do you want to bet that David Koresh had a gas mask and that the babies, they didn't have any? He did sell gas masks, by the way. So there were gas masks at Mount Carmel. Check out that video I did about merch on how selling merch can really corrupt an ideology. I don't know how people hero worship this guy. I can't get behind beating babies. Oh, we are moving on. Koresh seemed obsessed with food. He had a fixation on it. He worried to his wives that he was eating too much food. Then he would fast. Then he would binge. He deprived his followers of food. God was talking to him about what food was okay. And God said Doritos were cool. Could with Doritos. Now, this was 1993. God had a lot to worry about. Do you really think he cares if Mr. Retardo is eating too many chips? Notice how overbearing Koresh is with his followers who seem to be in this trance, yet how cowardly he is around people not under his spell, like the police. Let's read this other segment from The Sinful Messiah about how he tried to kidnap Brahmin Bun's son and the cops came. Her son Sean, or Wisdom as he was called at the time, was also gone. Howell had sent the boy to Texas in the care of Branch Davidian, Novalette Sinclair, according to Robin Bunn's and police. Sinclair was one of the women who kept Sean while his mother worked. Incensed, Robin Bunn's went to the Laverne Police Department. Bunn's accompanied police to the house on White Avenue. She identified the woman she believed to be Howell's wives, including her own mother, Janine, and treacherous, whatever. Howell told police what they suspected. Sean Buns was not there. He was in Texas. Sergeant John Heckworth and other police officers noticed Howell's voice was trembling. He hardly seemed a foreboding figure, a prophet with the might of God behind him. There was a hint of anger too in Howell's face. Hackworth thought he knew why. Howell was no longer in control. The police were. His followers saw him reduced to a mere mortal. Wanting to put a scare into Howell, Laverne police gave him 48 hours to return Sean Buns to California or face kidnapping charges. The media would be alerted, police said. Before police left, Howell asked to speak to Robin Buns. Robin, you know more than these people, Howell implored. Shut up, the police officer snapped at Howell. She's being deprogrammed. Am I that far gone, a stunned Buns asked herself. Howell walked around like a zombie after police left, Janine Bunn said. He couldn't believe that Robin Bunn's had gone to with the authorities. She stuck a knife in my heart and twisted it, Howell said aloud. Two days later, Sean Bunn's was back home. Police returned to the Laverne house and asked to see the 14-year-old Australian girl, but she had gone to Texas along with Howell. So he cowered and immediately retreated. That boy is alive because of what his mother did. That is free will for anyone who has any doubts about the existence of free will. She had it and she took it and she saved her son. Now, the thought of the police scared David. Here's a funny story. A former member of the Branch Davidians called Mark Brill became David's biggest rival. First, he was his best friend. Now, the story of Mark Brill is 
long and important. We really don't have time for it in this video. This video is already going to be over an hour. So Mark was recruited in California and then he moved to Mount Carmel, actually Palestine, to finish his master's in religion. And then he took jobs with the Branch Davidians doing computer work. Mark is mostly blind, but he has some vision. So long story short, Mark saw a 13 year old Australian girl who was not familiar with the cult teachings coming out of David's bedroom. And this is when Mark Brault finally realized, hey, David Koresh is a pervert. These girls, they weren't chosen by God. Now, this is a realization that nearly every member of the audience has already had after being familiar with Koresh for only an hour. However, it took Mark Brault many years. Okay. Now they also jammed together in David's band. And I wonder if the music was better, would Mark have looked the other way for a little bit longer? You know what I mean? Like uh, 14 and in the cult, that's cool. 13 and not in the cult. Nah, that's creepy. Plus the album is bad. Of course, Brault was over it. Even the blind man could see that David Koresh was on some bullshit. Now, soon after this, Koresh introduced his new light teaching, and that teaching is that he could sleep with everyone's wife, and they couldn't. So Mark Brault left. He did not want David Koresh sleeping with his wife, obviously. Brault went back to Australia, and he began unrecruiting the people he had helped recruit to Koresh's cult. He and his new wife convinced former Branch Davidian members that David Koresh was a cult leader. Koresh got mad. He traveled to Australia to win them back. Now this means that David Koresh must confront Mark Brault. So Mark tells his brother-in-law that he and the missus are going to confront David Koresh. And if they are not back by 10 p.m. to call the cops, he knew Koresh was violent. So Mark Brault and his wife go to confront David Koresh in front of a meeting of uh, on the fence Branch Davidians. Koresh says that he is the second coming of Christ and Brault leaves. He's offended and he leaves. This leaves Koresh alone to preach to this group of followers uninterrupted. But remember, Mark had told his brother-in-law to come for them and this was before cell phones. So nobody told the brother-in-law that his sister was okay. So the brother-in-law comes in knocking on the door. This is the police, he says. And David Koresh got so scared of the police that he ran out the back and jumped on a bike and pedaled away. Pedaled away down the alley, mm -hmm. scared of a knock at the door. Now that's the funniest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I choose to believe that it was a little bicycle. So this guy, he beats up babies. He has parents of women hit the women so that they follow him in case they ever talk back. He sleeps with his friend's wives, but when the cops are around, he runs away out the back. This is the man that set off a chain of events that led to the death of 76 Branch Davidians and then plus the six, and then 168 people later. There is no greater comedy writer in the world than God. This is the main character. Full points for charismatic leader. Oh, people will complain. Koresh is not handsome. He's not talented. He's not charismatic. How can you have the main character be someone you don't like? Because that's what happened. Koresh was a man of extreme importance, and he was a clown, a complete clown. He was the unwanted bastard child of a teenage mother who he called a prostitute. His mom was like, I am not a prostitute, but that's what he said. <laughs> I'd be mad about that too. He had a learning disability. The only book that he could read was the Bible, and he became a famous cult leader off of that. Harvard graduates followed him. They followed a Mr. Retardo. Why is he the lead in the story? Can't we have somebody better? What if we embellish and say that he's a hero so we can make a movie where there's good and there's bad? No, no, we don't get a Hollywood story. He was a trash clown phenomenon who made bad music and he was a jerk and the FBI were jerks and the ATF had a flimsy warrant and they were jerks too. Everybody in this story sucks, except for the people who died, especially the children who died but all of our main characters, awful. So full credit to David Koresh. I'm beginning to hate the Hollywood stories anyway. This, this is a real cult leader. If history wants to martyr him, that's for the future to decide. I won't help, that's for sure. So those are our categories. You know the categories. 
What's the verdict for the Branch Davidians? Drum roll, please. 4.5 goat heads out of five. Now, if Koresh's sermon had been better or if his album was any good at all, they would have gotten the full five. Yes, he's wicked. He's very wicked. I said he was wicked from jump. This isn't rape my church. It's rape my cult. They get a 4.5 goat heads because they earned it. RIP to his followers. Koresh would have been nothing without you. Now to the Christometer. We all love the Christometer. What are the chances he was the Messiah, the next Christ? Now, are we talking children's Bible Christ or Essenes fighting the Romans Christ? The Christ we know is a fictional character that may or may not be based on a real person. If it was a real person, that person may not be the peaceful hippie we all know and love. He may have been a violent revolutionary. That's open for debate, and we've gotten a lot more material these past few decades with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those actually became public only in 1991, 1992, so shortly before the Waco incident. So there was so much biblical hoopla happening at that time. Were the early 90s just more interesting? I feel they got Indiana Jones vibes and we're getting stupid Terminator vibes. They had the Dead Sea Scrolls. They had Leonard Nimoy on TV talking about the pyramids. We've got chatbot GPT and a bunch of fight videos. Ugh. You can't even have a fiery death cult anymore because they're all influencers now and they all have brand deals. And you know, HelloFresh doesn't want to get involved with all that. So the time has passed. It's over. <laughs> what a ridiculous tangent. Back to the Christometer. Back to rate my cult on the Christometer. Okay, what is the Christometer rating for David Koresh? Can we even compare David Koresh to Jesus Christ? As far as we know, when the Romans came for Christ, he did not run out the back and jump on a little bicycle in the alley and a little pedal away. Okay, that's, that's not what the story said. There's four stories. They don't mention that. It was 2,000 years ago. He would have jumped on a donkey and ridden away. We actually have an AI representation of that. <laughs> Things that did not happen. <laughs> that's so stupid. So... Is my personal and professional YouTube opinion that Koresh was not the Christ or the Messiah. They had cameras on Mount Carmel for days after this, and no one was raised from the dead. God did not swoop down and admonish Janet Reno for her stupid, stupid actions. There were no earthquakes. There were no floods, no natural disasters. And the Oklahoma City bombing only hurt working people and children. God simply was not involved in this. Nevertheless, David Koresh died at 33 after a siege with New Rome. He wasn't persecuted for his beliefs, but for his gun business and his abuse of underage girls, which Jesus did not do. No, nope, no. They could come out with a new Dead Sea Scrolls tomorrow that said, Jesus traded in swords and molested children. And I would be like, no. Which Jesus? It's a common name. I'm sure it was a common name back then. Prove it was my Jesus. So don't come at me in the comments with this. Maybe Jesus did. No, no, no. Koresh performed no miracles unless you count sabotaging a car from a distance. And that's not even proven. When asked to raise the dead, a simple request of the Messiah, Koresh went running to the cops. To me, these are not the actions of a Christ. But I've never met one before. So what do I know? So reluctantly, very reluctantly, I give David Koresh 20% on the Christometer for being 33 years old and dying in a fire against Rome. This is based on the Essenes interpretation of Jesus's last stand only, and I am keeping a very open mind because even that is not proven. In my opinion, David Koresh owes Jesus points for being a perv and beating babies. But 20%, you gotta give it to him. So the takeaways, careful with your teenage daughter. What could this man possibly want with my 17 year old daughter? Says the damn fool. The dad that ran David Koresh off after his daughter had that abortion in this 1977 incident. That man was absolutely right. Do you think he was watching this fiasco being like, see, I told you so. I told you so. Dad, you gotta run these shady dudes off or else you wind up 63 years old and raising a grandbaby you half don't even like. So good for that guy. Yeah, another takeaway is that Rome wins, but Rome is nicer now. 
That's why they didn't open fire on the Bundy crew. You know you kill more flies with honey than you do with tear gas. That's on an FBI poster. It's right next to the hang in there kitty poster. Yes, at their offices. I bet their office is pastel now. And most importantly, the most important takeaway is you don't trust musicians. David Koresh, Charles Manson, the Pied Piper. You can't turn your back on any of them. Anyway, thanks for watching. Subscribe.